Okay, welcome to the 67th episode of an Evolving Man podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be speaking to Shashi Saluna. Shashi is the author of Tantra Made Easy, published by Hay House. She's been teaching for over a decade and runs teacher trainings, as well as being part of a team creating international Tantra festivals. She's currently making a feature documentary, Sex to Spirit, following one man on his life-changing journey into Tantra. She originally trained in psychology at Oxford University and offers training courses globally about trauma, Tantra and relationships. Welcome, Shashi. Thank you. Thanks for having me on this great podcast. Mm, Well, thank you. Thank you. I I love to kind of begin the podcast by just saying how I either came across your work or we met. And it's kind of an interesting one. It was 2007. And it was an Andrew Fretwell workshop about Chine Zhang. And my mother had said, do you want to come on this workshop? I'm like, well, go on then. And <laughs> it was mostly women. I think there was one other man and myself. And uh, you came, I think, on the Sunday. Yeah. And well, it was a long time ago. I'm like, yes, it was Sunday. Sunday, <laughs> <laughs> like 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So, <laughs> our paths have crossed a few times via email over the years uh, and synchronicities. And so, I was like, "Oh, I'd love to speak to you." So, thank Aww. you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. So, how I love to begin the podcast is, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your journey. What got you into the work you now do? Yeah, I'm going to start where I don't normally start because of your podcast and say that perhaps it started with my schooling because I uh, live here in the home counties and uh, I also grew up in this world of British boarding school culture. I went to a day school for most, a girls day school for most of my schooling, which thank God I had, so I did have parental connection, Um, but all the boys I dated were from, you know, these sort of posh boarding schools in this area around Berkshire. And then in sixth form, I didn't want to be at home because my sister was going to university. So I opted to go to a boys boarding school where they took girls in the sixth form. And I sometimes say to friends, well, I got interested in Tantra because I'm recovering from the British boarding school system, you know. Um, But, you know, joking aside, I got you know, it was our time of sexual exploration. And suddenly here we are. I mean, what a ludicrous system. There were like 500 boys in the school and suddenly 40 girls get kind of plonked in the middle with our long hair and long skirts and, you know, like strutting around. And the boys didn't know what to do with us, you know. And um, I I actually formed some very deep friendships and talked a lot with, with boys about their experiences there. And realized how fucked up sexuality is in Britain, but especially in this kind of mm. upper class world, um, which, as you know, as we know, is a lot of our, our future leaders or our leaders now started in this system. So I got actually while I was at school, I, you know, when I was 17, I started in my biology to do I did a project on the difference between the genders. And I did I started to get into ev- evolutionary biology mm-hmm. and also feminist biology. I had a really good tutor who who really sort of pressed me to explore biology in in, in very unusual ways. And he was also an Oxford graduate and he sort of got me to go into Oxford. And so by the time I was applying, I knew, well, I'm interested in psychology, but it started with gender. It started with gender and sexuality as as topics that I was curious about and trying to understand. And so I think it's no wonder that I ended up um, you know, for the rest of my life. Well, I had a little period where I was just kind of, <laughs> I was, you know, I left Oxford and I, and I'd studied psychology of Buddhism and Buddhist chanting and consciousness. And I was all into meditation and all these things. And so for a while, I, I had had such unfulfilling sexual experiences, of course, because of the world we were in being so repressed. It was just this thing I waited to be over with. I had no pleasure in it. And I, I really didn't get sex at all. So I got more interested in spirituality. I was having more interesting experiences there. And so I was kind of like by the age of 20 or 21, I was kind of done with sex celibate and buddhist and and traveling around india and just sitting with enlightened masters and i was more interested in transmissions of truth than in dating and relating 
but then um then i fell in love which always you know knocks everything sideways doesn't it mm -hmm. i fell in love with someone in enlightenment like i had a moment of satori sitting with with a guru and so did this man and we had like two days of not being able to speak of just seeing truth together of being in this profound satori and so I started a relationship from a place of incredible awakening. And then we discovered we could argue about the washing up. And so it's like, wow, we know we are God and you are God and we're all divine, but like we can argue about the washing up. So I began, I sort of kind of went backwards. Many people are like in relating and then trying to find spirituality. I went for the highest level of spirituality and then got pulled back into, into the human level and have been trying to integrate, you know, learning, learning about integrating the, the the our spiritual self with our human self and then of course that led me into trauma because it's, that's so much trauma there and that and that our trauma is essentially the blockage between us and living our highest potential and living our love so you know that's a bit of, about my journey i i dedicated my whole life to it i i, I left i was meant to do a, a phd at cambridge and i had a, a gap here and i'm still on it <laughs> <laughs> 25 years later or something oh. <laughs> so i've i've lived a very unconventional life mostly 20 years living in thailand five in india a few in bali now i'm in costa rica i'm just uh, unconventional <laughs> beautiful beautiful what an amazing journey yeah <laughs> thank you and i was very blessed to speak to shahid your partner yeah um, a month six weeks ago so I kind of heard some of your travels and you know where you you'd been teaching up you were in uh, mexico was that we were yes i think yes six weeks ago we were in mexico right wow wow so i'd love for you to describe a little bit just so for people who don't know what tantra is because i think in the west there is this um, this idea that tantra equals sex I'd love yeah you share it. what is tantra please yeah, so what Tantra actually is about weaving, it's about seeing reality through as a oneness that is that is experiencing itself through polarity. So, you know, oneness, God, the divine, whatever we want to call it, is this sort of intangible thing that, that many religions are interested in. But Tantra and Taoism actually are interested in how we experience life as humans, and that is seen as polarity. Um, and so the big polarity, the foundational polarity in Tantra is consciousness and energy mm -hmm. or the part of us that is witnessing life mm -hmm. um, and the part of us that feels life or is experiencing life. And they're seen as masculine and feminine, but it's not about men and women. I mean, it can be, but it, it's like our, our own masculine and our own feminine, if you like. And there's this concept of divine union, which is whenever we, we have a, a sense of split, um, there is... A feeling of disharmony and it can lead to um, all kinds of you know unhappiness sickness depression whatever and so we have this inherent desire for unity and that unity is an inner unity ultimately between parts of ourselves that become separated but one of the most profound places to experience it is through our outer relationships because we will project inner splits into out of relationships and we will fall in love with people that reflect that split to us as well so we have this amazing opportunity when we fall in love to <laughs> to see where wherever we need to do that healing process and with the right tools and understanding we can use our intimate relationships to create divine union where does sex fit in? Well, sex can be a physical experience of divine union. So we use consciousness and energy in the physical act in many ways in Tantra. You might be like, for example, a man might be watching and his and his woman might be dancing. So she's expressing Shakti or energy and he's expressing Shiva or consciousness. And in that act, which we do in a conscious way, not like not like a strip club where it's like you know all about consumerism and and it's unconscious and, and whatever but in a conscious way then we are activating polarity in order to come together so i might dance my partner might watch and then we come together with that polarity and make love and we bring opposites together and then we both uh, have a direct experience of unity consciousness or god consciousness to help you know us remember our true nature and who we really are so it is um, and it doesn't have to be sex, but of course, it's one of the most interesting ways to play with polarity. Um, 
but in the Vigyang Bhaira of Tantra, for example, which is an ancient tantric text, there are meditations like um, whilst eating food become the taste of the food. So mm. it could be sex, but it could be eating a strawberry with full consciousness and, and merging with the flavor and being so total in our experience, our sensual experience of life that we in that moment enter into the eternal and remember who we are. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. So, yeah, it reminds me of, uh, there was, a, I don't know if you know a lady called Kavita Ray. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, because I, I live in Hebden, I, I meet lots of people like this. And I remember listening to her speak and she was saying about Tantra, if it was a meter long piece of rope, then sex would just be the one centimeter uh, part or something like that. And I was like, oh, I get that. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it would be possible. It is possible. I run women's groups for five weeks. We're just women together. We're, yeah. You know, we are working with sexual energy. Um, and, you know, in Taoism, there were Taoist monks who were celibate, essentially, but not celibate repressing, which is what we get in, in our more like in the Christian or other Western systems. Muslim, I mean, many, they're repressing sexuality to try and be spiritual. But the Taoist monks and the Tibetan Buddhists, for that matter, were moving their sexual energy, even sometimes into fantasy, but it was usually like a god and a goddess or whatever, but they were using that sexual energy internally to, to do this inner alchemy work, so not repressing. And so this is a very huge difference is desire can lead us astray if we separate it from consciousness and then we just become hedonistic and then you get into addiction or whatever. But if you repress desire, it's also, it's like trying to push a beach ball under the water. It's just going to explode out sideways. You know, it's, it's going to come back with full force. So we need to learn how to deal with desire. Demonizing it doesn't help. Making it conscious and embodying it is the key because desire is a projection, you know, and like we see a, beautiful man or beautiful woman, whatever. And we project our desire outwards and then we lust after that thing. If in that moment of desire, we go into our own body, oh, I'm noticing like a warmth in my groin. I'm feeling bubbles in my belly. I'm feeling expansion in my heart. We embody it. We come back to ourself. And that's where the healing and transformation happens. And then it doesn't matter whether you end up with that person or not. What matters is that we brought consciousness into the body to meet the Shakti of the energy. And this healing happens. And then we're not ruled by desire or fighting desire. We're just able to integrate it. Mm, thank you. That's really beautiful. I I think what I see in British society and I feel Western culture as well is that we often project out that, you know, you mentioned the masculine, the feminine, what I learned at school. And I feel these very much part of the ethos of British society is the feminine's kind of seen as less than I had to suppress anything that was playful, joyful, sensual, touching. I had to hate that part within myself. Yeah. And by what happened then i projected onto someone else yes you've got it i need that yes oh my god tell me about it so i i had it i mean i'm in the woman's body but i also had that i was at a boys school i did economics i did physics i did biology and maths i mean i did all i'm proving myself in a boys world i was in the army i was a lance corporal you know i was the oxford scholar i did everything that i was told to do that is worthy what did I stop doing? I stopped singing, I stopped dancing, and I stopped, you know, all the feminine, playful, beautiful things, because I was told those are not important, those won't make you money, those won't get you far in life, those are just a hobby, There's, and there was no time left for them. Well, when I was 20, I'm still quite young, 22, 23, I started Tantra, I'd, I had a Tantric partner, and we were having amazing Tantric sex, and I had intense pain in my ovaries. I went for a scan, I had a cyst, like a massive cyst on my ovary. And they said, okay, we've got three months and we're gonna operate. I don't know why they gave three months. In those three months, I bought some books on the shadow side of the feminine. I went into nature, which was the jungle. And I just, I did Taoist practices and meditated. And the big realization I had was that I had abandoned my wild woman. Mm -hmm. I had repressed my own feminine, even though I'm in a woman's body. And, and it, you know, in favor of being successful in, in this male dominated world. And my ovary was showing me that it was sick because of it. So that that night that I had the realization, I invited her. I also read some mythology about um, Queen Inanna having to abandon Lilith, her wild woman, 
-hmm. in order to get a, a throne in the kingdom of patriarchy because she was a queen before that in a matriarchal world. And they said, well, now patriarchy is coming. If you want a throne, you can have it, but your wild woman has to go. And when I read that mythology, I was like, oh, I was given a, a throne. I, you know, I'm the Oxford graduate boarding school. You know, I'm the star pupil in that patriarchal world at the expense of my femininity. You know, that was what the price I had to pay. And when I realized that I wept for, for that loss and I invited her back in my body. The next morning I had so much pain. I bent my knees, all this blood came out and I knew the cyst had left my body. I just knew it was gone because it was there because of the repression. And from that day on, I picked up guitar, ukulele, the harp, belly dancing. I have not stopped being creative. I am so happy to have reclaimed my feminine. And that's why I started doing a lot of women's healing work and Taoist healing work with women because of my own healing. So I really resonate. I mean, I realize it has a different impact on a man because you repress it and then have to look for it outwardly. But then for me as a woman in that system, I repress it and then I don't have a femininity to bring to my partnerships. You know, I have like economics, you know, and physics. You know, it's not not really needed by a man. <laughs> you know, it's it's my femininity and my beautiful song and my dance, and it's my feminine that is my gift to my partners, you know. And um, so, you know, it was a huge part, a huge part of my healing to do that reclamation of, of the feminine. And, and as you heard Shahid say, he works a lot with men reclaiming their inner feminine as well. So it, it, all of us have suffered in this patriarchal system, in whatever bodies we're in, we've all suffered. And there's, as you say, hatred towards the part of life that makes life worth living, mm. you know? You know, they often say the masculine makes it work, but the feminine makes it worth it. Mm -hmm. And it's like our masculine side, our ability to make spreadsheets and organize things and whatever we can, we can, you know, get goal orientated. But what's all the, what's all that money and business for, if not for being in beautiful nature, listening to amazing music, making love to a beloved, all the feminine is what makes it worth it. And so the hatred and rejection of the feminine is at great detriment to everybody. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I really resonate with that. The part of life that makes life worth living. Yeah, I think part of my healing journey and when I had my breakdown, I was living in the monastery. I worked, worked with a Jungian analyst and she got me to start painting. I was just painting black and white Chinese calligraphy because my mother's a Chinese brush painter. And after about six months, my therapist said, what about some color, Piers? I'm like, no, I haven't perfected black and white yet. You know, and it's just not a bit of color. And so that began my journey and I started to create. I mean, oh. I have this, these are some of my oh wow. My paintings. I have Amazing. A, an attic full. And that was my part of my way through healing. Was oh. To drop into feeling, into grief, and to really feel the pain exactly grief is the doorway to love you know and our especially us brits you know not crying stiff up a lip you know just this kind of bravado and strength that we're taught to have is so detrimental to our well-being because it's only when you've grieved that you know love mm -hmm. you know and trying to hold it all together is the it's the worst thing we could be doing mm -hmm. it's the absolute worst thing we could be doing I, and I, it's something i love about tantra it has a lot of emotional work in it just seen as a kind of shakti thing to feel emotions and it's it's just got this simple thing of like feel it feel it in your body express it don't get too attached to the story or fixing it just keep letting it through and then you realize it's so connected to sexuality you can't be a sexual being if you're not an emotional being mm -hmm. i always say if you want if you want to be multi-orgasmic you have to be multi-emotional it's so connected mm -hmm. if we want deep love we have to be able to grieve if we want passion we have to be able to feel anger you know like each emotion is connected to different parts of our sexual and intimate expression and it's about making love to life so repressing it is really harmful. And this idea that pain needs to be pushed down into the underworld, into our unconscious is so harmful because then we live a split life. And I think this is a huge part of Tantra as well, is healing that split. 
the split life between our face, our front, our like, you know, proper politician, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then underneath it is all the shadow. And again and again, we see the politician on the front and then comes the news headline. Oh, they're having an affair. They went to a prostitute, this, that, that. And everyone gets so <gasps> about it. And it's like, of course, you know, because our whole culture, it's a system. It's not like this one's different from that one or the one that came before. The entire system is encouraging us to be inauthentic and to split our emotional life away and push it underwater where it distorts mm. and and it and it's it becomes our shadow self as Jung of course was very deeply into and it's that shadow that has you know the affair and the lies and the, goes to the pressure and does whatever it's doing it's that shadow self that hasn't been integrated and it leaves us feeling inauthentic as human beings and of course it comes out in relationships as well mm -hmm. so this is a very big part of tantra is healing the shadow and integrating it healing is integration healing is feeling and integrating it's not fixing it's not getting rid of it's feeling and integrating healing is feeling love love healing is feeling wow so i'd love us to segue into trauma and relationships you know why is it, you know, I've been listening to obviously your interview with Shahid, but then your other podcast, and I'll put a link to it uh, in the description about trauma and relationships. What is the, you know, why is it that trauma seems to surface in relationships? <laughs> Because it's relational <laughs> so, so so trauma like we think of trauma as like traumatic events which is a type of trauma you know like if you're in an earthquake or whatever it's shocking to the body a trauma is actually defined not as the event but as our nervous system's capacity to process or digest an event so basically, you know, if two people are in the same event, for one, it can be traumatic and another not. I think a good example I always give is like a roller coaster. You know, there could be two people on the same roller coaster and one can really like, woohoo, yeah, and you know, really experience it. And they get off feeling exhilarated and the other one contracts and they're like, ah, and they get off and they're traumatized. It's to do with the nervous system's capacity for an experience. And when we're younger, our nervous system is much more fragile and, and when we're older. And so events that happen can create trauma and that's a sort of incompleted response in our body. So that's important to remember. Um, but the bigger thing that I've come across with my trauma work is that, especially in, in my work of, um, that I'm doing is, okay, there are the big, the big things like an earthquake, but most people's trauma is relational trauma. Mm -hmm. And relational trauma is the trauma we feel when the people who were meant to be our caretakers are not keeping us safe, basically. Um, so they might be neglecting us, you know, going off and doing their own thing. They might be violating us, crossing our boundaries for their own pleasure or their own purpose, um, or um, or even abusing us, taking out their unresolved emotions on us. And there we've got violence and, and rape and other things like that, um, which is their trauma, of course, unresolved trauma, of course, being passed on down, which doesn't justify it, but it does explain it. And so this relational trauma is the bigger part. And I, and I see that so many people coming to Tantra workshops are actually coming to heal that they don't think it in their head like okay i've got relational trauma i'll go to do a workshop but they're coming because their intimacy their love's lives their sex lives their relationships aren't working and the reason they aren't working is because of unresolved relational trauma so that's why i like to teach about it to help people understand it more and the thing is especially one till seven like these early years are very formative years and we don't have a physical memory of things that happen there and also whatever's happening is normal to you because you don't have anything anything to measure it about so if you have an aggressive father and a shut down mother that's just normal because you don't know anything else but it is impacting your nervous system you're not getting that secure um, attachment that you need you're not getting the safety that you need you know and so um, that that's where relational trauma kicks in and of course back to our topic of boarding school you know you've got a whole bunch of traumatized people shoved into one space there is less of that um, commitment that you have with family mm. um, and so there's there's a lot of bullying and harshness and and older kids and teachers um, passing down trauma to younger ones pa trauma this kind of relational trauma is deeply deeply linked with power mm. and so it's also about abuse of power 
when you're at power equals responsibility and when we're in a position of power like being a teacher or a priest or whatever we to you have right use of power is to use our power to protect and to empower those who are in our power only those two things protect them and help them stand on their own feet and that's what parents should be doing that's what teachers should be doing it's what we should all be doing when we have a position of power but no one teaches us about power and what we see being done as power is like when you've got the power you can beat up the younger kid when you've got the power you can take advantage just like they did of you then you get the power then you can do it back to them and that's what's happening you know it's like right now i've got the power and i'm going to get my own back on you and we see this misuse of power again and again and again um, sadly because power can be the most beautiful thing we need it we do need to be have powerful parents looking after children and powerful teachers and powerful guides but unfortunately we have such a misuse of power so I'd say almost everybody has um, relational trauma it's just a matter of degree you know if, if, you, if you had parents who tried their best then there's less trauma going on but there's, there's bound to be in places and then of course there are very severe examples like we see working with um, horrific cults and things like that um, children who are raised in very traumatic um, environments so this trauma i think i wish i call relational trauma sometimes it's called complex ptsd um mm -hmm. You know, it has different names. Um, relational trauma, I think, is the one that's just the simplest and explains it. This, I think, is a is a bigger one. You know, in a way, when you've been in an earthquake, you know you've been in an earthquake, and then you can go and get psychological help for it. If you've been with dysfunctional parents or bullying in school, you often don't even remember it, or it was normalized, and so you don't even realize there's a problem, and you're just going through issues in relationship, and you don't even know why. And it's because of relational trauma. And, you know, that's why I like to really speak about it and, and bring it in consciously so that we can start to um, heal from the past and, and recreate a better future. Mm, thank you. Thank you for bringing this to light. Yeah, I, I was reading, I interviewed about a month ago, a psychiatrist who wrote this book here. And she talks about that, you know, relational trauma. It's not me. Annabel Gonzalez, she says, you know, that, that very similar. If it's an earthquake, yeah, we, we know that. But relational trauma, it's, you know, much more complex. And it so is. many of us have it. It is. We, we, you, we don't even realize, you know, and and so that's why you know, that's why i like to make it conscious and, and and there are lots of models that we can use i i love i think i love neo tantra which i didn't really express as classical tantra with old practices or whatever but neo tantra which is basically modern tantra is a fusion of the more spiritual practices working with sexual energy sublimation and meditations and so on fused with psychotherapy mm. and osho really started that trend and I think this is such a beautiful blend to have the, the human and the spiritual, the psychotherapy and the, and the spiritual guidance so that we have both. So we're not bypassing our trauma and just being spiritual people wearing white and whatever and saying namaste to our beloved, but also that we have the tools um, to hold space for each other. And if partners can learn to do that, this is so valuable because our traumas are going to show up in our most intimate relationships because they're relational trauma, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I get reached out to people. You know, my main work is with ex-boarders by wives uh, or partners just saying, yeah, I can't handle my partner anymore. You know? mm. um, and it's like that trauma that's carried on from childhood into relationships. So I'd love you to share a bit. What can we do really about working through the trauma? You know, we've got mm. maybe, you know, you talk in your, uh, the episode, the podcast episode about triggers, you know, I, I often find before I do a podcast, I feel some nervousness. And I think that's partly my trigger of um, not speaking up. Mm. You shall not speak. And so I can feel, I know that I've got to go for a walk, have my cold bath, <laughs> regulate my nervous system. Yes. What about in relationship? Shashi? Resourcing yourself. Well, all of these tools are good, you know, tools, basically. I like to call them tools we need we need tools relationship is the biggest journey of our life and we're kind of plunged into it without a tool just expected to find a partner get married and that's it i mean 
it's another part of our education system, isn't it? You know, we learn how to do Pythagoras theory that we never <laughs> use again. And nobody teaches us about relating sexuality, intimacy, or even running a business for that matter. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think that tools are very helpful. And, and what, you know, what, what you just shared is having awareness. So I'm aware that when I speak, an old tra trauma around not speaking up can arise for me and you begin to notice oh i feel it in my body i notice i feel maybe kind of tightness in my chest or i feel a fluttering in my heart that's called sensate focus or focusing on the sensations in the body it's the absolute like foundation of trauma healing to go into the body and name it um so that's really helpful you can do it alone or with someone else you know you can say to your partner oh, i'm noticing i've got this heat rising in my chest i'm noticing that my hands are coming into fists i'm noticing i feel charged i notice i feel like running out of the room and that i am noticing that is our our shiva and our shakti our consciousness shiva noticing our shakti our emotions mm -hmm. instead of being ruled by them and just like charging off out of the room or, or hurling out a load of abuse to our partner we become lucid we're bringing consciousness to that trigger and we're saying i'm noticing that it's helpful sometimes of course there's some story and, and so there are communication tools like nonviolent communication where we can say when you don't wash up i notice or you know you wouldn't get that triggered about that when you're late for dinner and you don't call me and i've been cooking all, all evening for you and you don't show up i feel you know so it's helpful to have some kind of communication tool but the embodiment practices are really where the trauma healing is, is healed. So you might start with that line. I feel um, upset and angry and I'm feeling that here. I'm feeling it as heat in my chest. I'm feeling it as like, you know, tightness in my muscles. And I feel, I feel like shouting at you and I, you know, I want to hurt you because I feel hurt. And that kind of lucidity means you're not repressing your emotions, but neither are you just running, running them out wildly, which can be very emotionally unsafe for another human being, you know, to just pour out your stuff. And so this way we start to become um, hold space for our own triggers. So that's a really um, useful thing. Then um, you can also hack your triggers together after they've happened. So Shahid and I did a lot of this when we first met. It was always about driving, um, but we would get triggered. We drive very differently. We would have something where we get triggered and, you know, blah, 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 shout at each other, whatever, not, not such nice things. But afterwards, we'd, we'd hack it together. We'd be like, what just happened? Okay, well, this happened and then that happened and then I did this. And, but when we we're calm again and we go, okay, what I needed there is, is this and this and I needed that. And so we would start to create what we call um, our trigger drill, like a fire drill. Mm -hmm. And we'd be like, okay, next time we get triggered, let's do this, this, and this. So we started to work out, and we help other couples do this as well. We started to work out our own little fire drill of what, what helps us to get out of a trigger as quickly as possible together. So there are things you can do alone, like you mentioned, go for a walk, have a cold shower, and it's really good to know how to self-resource. But it's beautiful as a couple to resource each other and to, you know, co-regulate as it's called. And so, um, you know, there can be things like, um, we found that if we say, I choose love right now, and the other mm. person says, I choose love. Even if you don't feel like it, we're like, you know, <laughs> I'm pissed off with you. We go, I choose love. And the other one be like, yeah, I choose love. <sighs> and, and not feel like it, but a miracle would happen <laughs> and love would come back. Um, but also nonverbal things like pushing hands against each other, which is really good for boundary issues. You look at, in each other's eyes, you put your hands together and you inhale and you go, ah, and you just push hands, not to push the other over, but just to like meet like this. It's a brilliant trauma healing technique because the, the traumatic response to push someone away um, gets to be completed, but in a harmless way. Um, so we would use that instead of going into arguments. You did this, you were late, you should have shown up, or you showed up last week, blah, blah, blah. You could get in that for hours, but we would just put our hands together and be like, ah. and then after like three pushes, we'd be, okay, good. I feel, I feel heard, you know, <laughs> because our boundaries were met again. And then we don't need all the words and we're back to peace again. And we, you know, it feels resolved. So we we dis, we started to put together all kinds of trigger drills for ourselves and then we shared it with other couples um so yeah i think it's just a matter of getting tools um and and we have our set of tools and i always ask couples what tools do you have i'm always interested and i notice there are couples that have tools oh well we do this this, this. and then there are couples that don't there are couples who just like go into conflict and escalation and triggering and they live 
it, it takes so much longer. They live in this this big, emotionally unsafe environment, you know, that's exhausting, a lot of processing. And, you know, there's love there too. And that's what keeps people in it. But it's like, we don't have to have that amount of, of, of mess to, to have love and companionship. We can, we can begin to heal it and it becomes less and less. We noticed we got less triggered. We'd preempt things. We'd know when they were coming. We'd laugh about them more, um, or they just wouldn't happen or we'd just get out of them very fast. So it's like efficiency and building trust is part of that. Mm. You know, it's like, Actually, when I first met Shahid, I had my room broken into in Thailand by a very oh, aggressive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And he like smashed everything up. And then when I was back with Shahid, when he came close to me, my body would get triggered. And we did the pushing hands thing. I said to him, I need I'm getting triggered in the moment. I can't see the difference between you and that man. So you look like the enemy. And that's what happens with trauma. There's there's a merging because the hippocampus, you know, the memory part of the brain is is distorted in the amygdala. And so you literally can't tell the difference. And that's another relational trauma thing. If you had an aggressive father or mother or whatever, or teacher, and then your partner triggers that old part of you, you see them as the enemy, even though it's the person that's loving you. And you, you, we can't undo that. It's physiological in the brain, but we can get out of it quicker. And so that's understanding how the brain works, using reassuring words, reminding people you're not the enemy, pushing hands, all these kind of things um, that can help us. Mm, thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. So many amazing things you're sharing there. I think the push hands method, when you mentioned in the, the podcast I listened to about what happened to you in Thailand and then how it cleared very quickly just by putting your boundaries down yeah yeah it could have gone on for ages and i might have made all men into the enemy and all men are unsafe and got triggered by man after man even if i'd you know broken up that relationship and that's the problem is that mm -hmm. you, you can leave that relationship but the trauma is going to keep showing up because the trauma is in us and so what we need is a, is a, a partner that's like hey let's work through this trauma healing together why don't we have a relationship where we choose to build trust and heal trauma together as part of our theme. And that's a beautiful journey to go on with another human being. Mm, thank you. Yeah. I, I often see with my clients, but often men generally is we want everything to be perfect. If it's not, then we feel like we have to leave. And I've really got that these last few years with my wife is no, no, it's the repair. That's the beautiful part. Absolutely. Perfect. I know none of us is going to be perfect. We're all going to mess up. But when you realize, oh, I can mess up and still be loved and have the opportunity to repair. It's also not just about like, oh, I'm just loved. I'll do whatever I want. You know, <laughs> we want to learn how to be trustworthy human beings. I think that's the ultimate relational journey mm -hmm. is to learn how to use our power in, in the right use of power and how to be a trustworthy human being so that your heart is safe with me. And I know what that responsibility is, what it means and how to show up for you as someone who you can trust. So we're working towards that. And yet we weren't taught it. So we're going to, we are going to fuck up. Of course we are. It's a journey. And yet we, we need to just embrace that. Like, let's do this journey of love. We are going to fuck up. We're not going to intend to do that. We need to remind each other as well. Like, I don't ever want to hurt you. I don't, I don't want to fuck up, but I might do because I'm a human being and I'm full of these things. But my intention is to, is to see it, to heal it, to help you when you step off the path and to keep committed to love, which is such a reflection of our true nature so that we can heal and we can become better, better human beings and more, more the embodiment of our true self. And so, yeah, it, this, this idea of like showing up to relationship, like ready and perfect is such a hard burden for people. You know, why would you put that on your shoulders? Mm -hmm. It's too hard to live up to, but I think you're right. Our system has that, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a singer. Like I sing a lot, as I said, um, but I, I grew up very musical, but my, our, our world was like, you have to be grade eight. You have to be perfect. You have to be professional. You have to be a performer. 
so much pressure around that it's not even fun anymore and it's so competitive and I just gave it up you know when I was like 17 because it was so stressful mm -hmm. and then after this cyst thing happened I took up guitar and I, I love singing I sing almost every day of my life but I then found kirtans and heart songs and song circles and I was like great it doesn't matter if you sing off tune it's not about performing it's not about getting it right you can get it wrong you can get the words wrong it's about opening your heart and your throat and just having a good old sing with other people and it was so healing for me after growing up in the in the system that only kind of allows for perfection and that's like i said earlier about our politicians right we expect them to be perfect and then we project that they're perfect and then the press discover no they've been to a brush shoot ha ha we found them and it's like what a system is that it doesn't allow anybody to be real or to heal you know you're trying desperately to hide your shadows and hope no one ever finds out and keep it all under wraps what an exhaustion is that and tantra says come and be real I would say that Tantra isn't about enlightenment as the highest goal. It's about authenticity. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, bring forth your ugliest emotions, let them out, bring out your deepest desires, bring out, you know, just keep expressing it in front of other people and, 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 and be seen and be witnessed in that so that you can integrate as a human being and you can be the sluttiest, most sexual person. You can be all of it. You don't have to choose. You don't have to split. You don't have to be this on the outside and this on the inside. You can integrate it and be fully sexual, fully spiritual or, or fully whatever pieces that you've pulled apart. The most introverted extrovert, if you like, <laughs> you know, any, any polarity that has been split, we can bring it back together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And what would you say is the way that we do that? We bring those that are split. Because I see that certainly in my work, people who've been through complex trauma have a real split. They're just dissociated. They have no idea how to feel anymore. Yeah. But how do we do that? Integrate those sides. Well, so dissociation and split are slightly different. It's a major split, right? It's, it's consciousness leaving the body. And that happens when very traumatic events that are just so overwhelming that consciousness goes like up and out. Yeah. Actually, funnily enough, when consciousness goes on up and out, it can make us more spiritual. And a lot of great psychics had so much trauma in their childhood that they ended up living up, you know, up here. And they're incredible psychics, but they're often, you know, or not often, but they may have terrible health problems, maybe really overweight, maybe really struggling because they abandon the body and they can help many, many other people with their psychic skills, but they're at the price of their own dissociation. Not always, of course, you can learn to be a psychic and be, you know, um, in integration. But this is this is important to understand. Dissociation um, needs a slightly different healing uh, methodology. Um, and, you know, I use this word embodiment a lot, but this, this is really the key, like talk therapy. I mean, obviously I started with traditional psychology, but you can't talk your way out of dissociation. It's really about feeling safe to be in the body. This is key. If you realize that we dissociate and the moment we don't feel safe in the body, you're not going to come back in until you do feel safe. So you you can't just tell someone to be more conscious or be more present or be more embodied. We have to help them to feel safe to be in the body again. So there's various ways of doing that in Tantra. Like we use a lot of touch in Tantra, but the touch for dissociation is a steady touch that doesn't go anywhere. Because a lot of touch is always trying to move energy, arouse energy, make something happen, give pleasure. And that's all overwhelming to a dissociated person. You know, you just go into freeze or, or stay out of the body. And a lot of people, when, even when they're having sex, they're not there. They're dissociated, either in fantasy or just gone. And then they kind of pop back in later, or like it's over. So, you know, that's the first thing we always want to heal in Tantra is dissociation. And for that, we need to feel safe in this physical body again. So um, like I have a practice where one person's lying down, the other one would just touch the feet and hold them without moving and then say, what's here now? And the one lying down will, will say, well, I'm, I'm noticing warmth of your hands. I'm noticing just simple practice, but it's literally reassociating your consciousness into your body. And then we can move. And eventually we move to very um, uh, more vulnerable areas like having a hand over the genitals again no like with clothes on no stimulation no touch but just a hand cupped there we're so used to people always moving on our genitals trying to like activate them and make something happen that to have a hand cupped over your genitals that's not trying to get anything or do anything that's just deeply present with you that's feeling you and that's inviting you to feel what you're feeling 
that reassociates your consciousness into a place that can be very, very scary for so many. For men, it would be more, of course, the anus, for women, the vagina, the entrances into our inner world, mm -hmm. our inner body. They're extremely vulnerable. They're often violated. And then we continue to just force our way in there as adults because that's what we're taught sex is. So it was just like, how do we get it open? You know, have we got enough lube? And like, in we go. That's not going to help heal anything. We, it's a psychological thing. It's a safety matter. We need to put our hand over someone's anus or, or over their vagina or over whatever, even over the, the lingam as well. Just hold it and say, what are, you, what are you noticing here? And let them breathe, let them sound, let them safely come back in and, and re reassure them. I don't want anything from you. Nothing's going to happen. Give them permission as well. May I put my hand here? Let me know when you're ready. Will you please tell me when it's time to take it off? How are you feeling now? Like all of these kind of deeply communicated, reverential, safe, physical connections, which could be with a partner or with a therapist, like a sexological body worker. This is where you see people bursting into tears, crying for a long time, just with a hand holding them, because it's like, finally, I can arrive here. Mm -hmm. You know, I always say, foreplay should not be moving and touching and it should be holding it should be holding and waiting for you to arrive in your body you know waiting for okay i'm here i'm in my genitals or my feet or wherever i am because we go into trying to arouse the body when you're not even in it and then sex is something that happens to you and it's actually re-traumatizing again and again and people don't enjoy it they wait for it to be over they endure it they freeze through it it's just this or they go into massive fantasy projections. And we really want to go back into embodiment because that's the only place where healing happens and where we can feel this amazing feeling of safety. And so that's what we want to create for each other um, in the world of Tantra is like, it's safe to be in your body. A huge unsafety for us women is about our appearance because we were told everything's wrong about our bodies. And so I do a piece with women where we get to give a guided tour to other women and we say, well, this breast is smaller than this one. And I battled with it for years and I've got cellulite here and here's this scar. And, and to tenderly reveal our shadows in the presence of love instead of in the presence of judgment and to be seen in that. And then afterwards that woman lies down and the other women say, these are the breasts of the goddess. This is the belly of the goddess. This is the scar of the goddess. And they touch each body part. And it's so like to op to reveal our shadows and then have love poured in is just one of the most ultimate healing methods that we can have. And so a lot of different tantric exercises are just variations of this, of being able to feel safe, to be express something vulnerable and to be loved in that vulnerability and then whew, healing happens mm. wow sounds very powerful very beautiful I can imagine your five week courses having lots of exercises like that um, yeah wow. wow and it's it's beautiful on that course because it's just women together and so this there's this pressure taken off mm. sexually and it's like, oh, finally, we can just explore. I think this needed to happen in schools, that boys were trained in their sexuality and girls were, I mean, now they're getting rid of gender, but, you know, <laughs> in the old days, you know, like it would have been helpful to, to be taught, like these are breasts and, and discover for yourself how to touch them. You know, the first time our breasts were touched, we're like 14, 15 year old boys who were just like grabbing them. And then we got the feeling, oh, that's how they're meant to be touched. And then I teach women breast massage. Sometimes they're even in their fifties or sixties and they're, and they're starting to massage. And I say, just feel what's pleasurable. And they start crying. They're like, oh my God, I, I love it really soft or I never knew that, you know, I always let other people do things and I never found out what I liked. And, you know, now I'm past menopause and I'm just discovering what pleasure means. It's never too late though. I've had a woman, woman in her seventies come on my training and it's, you know, never too late. I just wish it was earlier for everyone. Yeah. And I think coming back to schooling, I do think, you know, these types of things, should be taught at school you know like Absolutely. sexuality relationships just basic things i know i i've thought actually of offering to do a general studies talk at my old school i've thought about it because we used to have quite interesting people ex-students coming in and giving talks and i thought maybe i could go in and do one but then i thought you know also the schooling system is so closed-minded mm -hmm. and and they probably go oh tantra that's that's some 
sexual thing and, and ban it and keep it you know keep everyone with just this biology textbook and then they're secretly watching porn as their as their teacher and that's the whole shadow light thing right the light side goes here's a biology book and here's how fertility works in an egg and a sperm which means nothing to like 14 year old 15 year old body that that's what you get or or here are all the stis you might get when you have sex and that's it no one teaches you about pleasure intimacy vulnerability how to make yourself safe you know any of that and then meanwhile, you're longing for that. And the only thing you've got is porn, which is created in the shadow by the shadow. It's a full shadow realm. I mean, there might be a couple of people making enlightened porn. I've heard there are, but you know, the majority of it is created by shadow for shadow. That's why it's full of, you know, really dark stuff. And what a place to go and learn, to go and learn from the darkness, to go and learn from the shadow realm, mm -hmm. and then try to bring that into, into sexual intimacy, Oof, you know, it's I, and I and I think it, there was hardly anything available when when I was young. It was a few magazines or whatever. But now I can't even imagine what the younger generations are going through. And I really, I you know, I really feel for them. Yeah. I really feel for them. Yeah. And so yeah, we do need a better in, uh, education system yeah. that really nourishes the human being. And that includes, I think one of the biggest things is vulnerability. Like when I've been asked what was missing from your early sex education, we were so taught not to be vulnerable. Everyone strutted around pretending they'd done everything. You know, when we were like 14 or 15, everyone was like, yeah, yeah, I've done that. Oh yeah, yeah, I've done level one, level two, whatever. There were these levels of intimacy and everyone pretended they knew everything and nobody knew anything, <laughs> yeah. you know? Exactly. And there was nowhere where you could go and say, I'm kind of scared about sex or, I actually don't know about it or, you know, there was nowhere to be vulnerable. And instead we all had this awful facade of pretense. And I think that's the biggest sadness I have about that age was, you know, not feeling safe to be vulnerable. Mm, thank you. It's something I'm, I'm a scout leader. I'm trying to bring vulnerability <sighs> into the teenagers. Like but I can only do it really with the leaders to model it and i'm trying to explain to them the importance of it and why to do it great because if we can acknowledge i feel fear they yes. will be able to, to to do it as well exactly and it keeps coming up in different podcasts i've done i, I interviewed a director of a, a movie called the work which is um it's a beautiful movie it's often fulsome prison it's a, basically a, a group of men's um you know convicts who do men's a men's weekend for four days where they're connecting with their emotions lots of tears wow and it's really it's rough you'll be in tears just watching the uh the the, the trailer i'll send a, a link to you after. yes do and he was saying that vulnerability is our superpower oh, <laughs> one or the other absolutely convict. You know, when I was talking about power earlier, it's been a huge topic that I've studied, power. I I know I noticed that the unhealthy power that we talk about mm -hmm. is split from vulnerability. And that's why it becomes abusive power, power over and and it's all about getting our own needs met when we've got the power. And in order to develop healthy power, which Taoism goes a lot into, inner power, it's more, you have to bring your vulnerability. It takes an, an incredible inner power to be vulnerable. It takes the power of courage, right? Super courageous to show your vulnerability. And if we can really do that, in that moment, we become empowered and we start developing a really beautiful inner power it's it's you know it's the healthy power that we need to have and and shift this system that we have of abusive power and and start honoring leaders who are courageous enough to be vulnerable wouldn't that be great if you know i remember who's it theresa may you know like mm -hmm. her whole time in power she was very powerful and you know in that traditional way mm -hmm. and then when she got fired or whatever happened she broke down and it's like Russell Brown made a video about it and talked about what a tragedy that our leaders can't bring that vulnerability into their leadership. Mm -hmm. And it just sort of comes out a little bit at the end there. But it's like, that's what we need is, is to be real instead of being this fake power, this mm -hmm. abusive power. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, in the UK, the last few days, we've had Boris Johnson 
has resigned and I see that fake power that I won't admit that I've made a mistake, I won't show vulnerability. Yeah. And then but then we know where he probably learned that from his parents, exactly. from the boarding school education. It's a systemic problem. You know, when I was, te I just created a course that was trauma te for Tantra teachers, because I think it's really important as Tantra teachers that we're trauma informed and also aware of our own trauma. Otherwise these kind of, um, there are misuse. I don't want to say Tantra is a perfect world. It's not at all. There, there's also power abuse happening in the Tantra world where people are taking advantage of their positions. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, something that I think is so important to see It's a systemic problem and we need to change the systems we can't just point out this guru messed up or this politician mm. it's very much like what's wrong with our system our system does not allow politicians to be vulnerable our system doesn't have enough you know it's too hierarchical it doesn't have enough circling it doesn't have enough feedback in it we you know we don't we don't honor the vulnerability that goes with the power there's just so much in our system that that creates that actually creates a, a traumatic world and prevents trauma healing. Mm. And what is needed is safety. It needs to be safe for Boris Johnson to be vulnerable. It needs to be safe for Theresa May. It needs to be safe for, for all of these people to be vulnerable, maybe not in total public space, but somewhere, mm. you know, somewhere we need to be able to be really vulnerable and not have to hide that part of ourself and hope no one ever finds it. Mm, yeah yeah thank you thank you so what other things have i got questions so i think one of the other ones i was when i was listening to your your um the podcast you mentioned about what if we've had a trauma but we don't remember it what do we mm. do then you know what mm -hmm. happened because some of us go I, I hear this a lot from the wives saying they won't do any work or they deny they've had any problems. Mm -hmm. But so what do we do in relationship if either we don't remember it or we're in denial? There's a big difference between not remembering trauma and denying that we have it <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> if we're in total denial, then there is more of a problem because mm -hmm. then we're going to project and say, well, all the relationship problems are your fault um, or you're just the wrong person or, you know, come up with all kinds of excuses. Um, I don't need help and whatever. So un un well, unfortunately, the first step is to kind of move through denial. And that's a kind of waking up process. And uh, I, the difficult thing in relationships is, uh, yeah, often, often it is the woman who's doing more psychological work and starts to see in her partner. And how to bring that. Of course, if you tell someone, oh, you're traumatized and, and fucked up, it's not, not very helpful. Um, we need to come with a lot of compassion and gently suggest, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if you, you always felt safe with your emotions. I'm wondering um, if it feels unsafe for you to cry as a man, you know, to be curious about the other person's experience and, and open a space for dialogue. And then, of course, there's things like watching things together, you know, like Gabriel Mate's made a documentary and, you know, there's lots more. There's also a great one that just came out by Matt Kahn on healing with love. You know, there are some great documentaries. And I think this is a good way to start a conversation is to is to watch or listen to podcasts like this, you know, to, to watch and listen to things and then have a conversation afterwards um, to to open up uh, the conversation. But you're right. It usually won't be like suddenly it won't be like oh yeah i was abused at school that's not what pops up it would more be like gosh i notice that i freeze during sex and shashi was talking about that oh i noticed that i i really go into fantasy and i'm not really in the body maybe there is something about that you know that's gen we generally are more like see the symptoms than remember the cause and so the the, the, the with the denial we just project our symptoms make it someone else's fault with awakening we start to realize wait, these are my symptoms I, and I wonder how I can heal them. That At that point, there's a chance to do some work at the point where we own that there are some symptoms, which, you know, doesn't have to be full of blame. It's just like, oh gosh, yeah, I'm, I'm really into fantasy and, and maybe there is a way to be more in my body. Let's be curious about that. Um, 
but then the next step is how do we heal it? You don't ever, so originally in psychology, we, we talk therapy, we thought we have to be able to talk through our problems, you know, so there's this Freudian, you know, what was your relationship with your mother like? Well, you know, there might be something there, but now we trauma healing, modern trauma healing from Peter Levine and, and Gabriel Mate, Basil van der Kock, this kind of trauma healing has realized we don't need to go into story. In fact, it can actually distract us or keep us attached to our own trauma. It's only helpful if you're having an emotional release. So if you tell your story and then you start crying, great, then tell your story and then have a good, then some point the words drop and you just have a good cry or you get angry and you beat a pillow. Great, then you're moving energy. But we never, we don't need to remember where trauma came from because as Basel van der Kock said, the body keeps the score. And what we need to do is to start recognizing how trauma shows up in the body, freezing, holding our breath, um, you know, getting triggered and charged, um, having the impulse to run away out of the room or get in the car and drive off or slam the door. And, you know, these are all trauma responses. These aren't parts of our personality. I mean, they, may, they appear to be part of our personality, but they're actually just trauma responses. And if we start to see them and understand them, then we can start hacking them. Like I said before, of like, oh, wow, I notice when conflict happens that my tendency is to slam the door and leave. How wonderful for a couple even just to say that together. I notice when I get triggered, I slam the door and leave. I notice when I get triggered, I kind of freeze and I hope that it all goes away. You know, great. That's already a huge level of lucidity. And that ownership is going to take away the power of the, of the triggers. And you bring your consciousness back with just that realization. So... And I said earlier that tracking the body or sensate focus, I'm noticing that I've got heat. I'm noticing that my body's contracted and I'm freezing. I'm noticing this. I'm noticing that. This is a primary method of healing trauma. And so you don't actually need to know where it came from. Many are pre-memory. And of course, very traumatic events, um, especially sexual abuse, we will actually leave the body and dissociate and we won't form a memory of it. And, you know, there was this whole time when everyone was sort of, oh, well, let's go for hypnosis and find out. And then, then there's a story. Is it true? Is it not? It doesn't really matter. We don't need to get too into is it true or is it not true? The body has its own level of truth. And if the body is having trauma response, then there's trauma in it. And we just want to know how to heal it. And, and then that's that. If uh, there is a memory in a story, there may be other work that you want to do eventually, like forgiveness work and letting go or, or, or whatever. Um, but primarily, it's about healing ourselves, you know, and that's the important part. Like, I want to live a full life and this trauma is holding me back. And, you know, let's, let's get this thing healed. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Shashi. So we've been talking about an hour now so i've got a few more questions how are you doing time wise yeah that's good for me i'll just top up my teacup i'm still okay. i'm still british even though i lived abroad for uh, 25 years although i'm drinking green instead of the <laughs> tea and milk <laughs> um one of the other things what have i got yeah i think i mean you've been talking a bit about this anyhow but I guess one of the things I've noticed a lot, especially for men, is this thing about being present and staying present. If we've had trauma or complex trauma, it's like we really struggle to be present. And I see that in our media. I see that online. You know, we've got to be doing stuff all the time, multitasking. How do you teach people, especially those who've been through trauma or struggling relationships, to be more present? The great question. I mean, we've got a whole name for it, like ADHD or whatever it's called that, you know, which wasn't even your microphone's gone off a bit. There we go. Sorry, oh. I was I, I was blowing my nose from the hay fever. <laughs> so we even have this this name of like ADHD, whatever it is, like attention deficit disorder that that didn't even exist before, because that's our world. Like we're distracted. We're in a distracted world. People watch three second videos and they're scrolling and they're distracted and we don't think of that much as being a trauma response mm -hmm. but of course it is and it's it's a dissociation dissociation as we said before means taking consciousness away from this moment from the embodiment of this moment and so you know these are great ways to avoid feeling 
And okay, it's okay sometimes to avoid feeling, maybe you just want to watch a movie one night and, and have a little break from processing. But when it becomes your daily habit to avoid feeling, you start avoiding life. And then you become this dull person that's not really living anymore, you know? And so, um, you know, that's why people say Tantra makes them feel so alive because we dive right in. We feel all the pain, all the feels, all the sexual energy, all the stuff that's in there and you feel fully alive again. Um, and this is so important. And with that comes presence. You become more present. Um, presence, however, is not something that I think you just do. I mean, you, you can't, the more masculine practices like Vipassana and Buddhism and meditation, you are learning to cultivate more presence. Um, so there is certainly, it, it is certainly helpful to do those practices. However, it will always be limited by trauma in your body that is creating a dissociation. So whether you're sitting to meditate, but just thinking for, you know, <laughs> 30 minutes <laughs> or fantasizing or doing something else, um, you know, the, you can't ever sort of say to someone, be more present, you know, because we need to question what's stopping you from being present in this moment. That's the question, not be more present, but what's holding you back from being present in this moment? It's a great question. It's like unjudgmental question. You can ask it in intimacy with your partner. You suddenly feel they're gone. You can say, hey, beloved, I wonder what's, what's stopping you from being here now. And then they can check and they can be like, well, I was just thinking about like what I need to shop and do tomorrow. But I notice actually that I'm feeling a bit afraid right now. I feel a bit rushed. You're moving a bit fast. And so I kind of whizzed off into my shopping list. <sighs> what I actually need is if you could just put a hand on me and we could just breathe together and I can come back here. Mm -hmm. You know, that would be, I mean, of course, that takes a high level of self-awareness, but that's the kind of thing Tantra is teaching us is to, is to question what's holding us back from being present, which is not actually the shopping list. That's not the thing holding us back. That's the strategy that we're using and that could be anything but it's not the shopping or the or the fantasy or anything it, there's a reason we've gone there instead of being here so there's something in your body so the body is always the key to presence because the body is always here now always you know this this touch is just this moment so the eternal moment is only happening in in this touch is not in the past it's not in the future it's right here right now so it's interesting that classical Tantra used a lot of senses as a method of meditation. I mentioned Vigyang Bharav Tantra earlier, which uses smell and taste and looking at the stars. And there's one that says when an ant is crawling on your skin, you just totally become present with the feeling of an ant walking on your skin and thus awaken. Mm -hmm. You know what? Because any sense is happening now. And so it takes you back out of dissociation and into this moment. Now, there can be pleasant senses or unpleasant senses, you know, that can be eating a strawberry dipped in chocolate, which is generally the tantric way. But other people, you know, will like maybe even use pain to make themselves more present. Like now I'm here, which can also be something interesting to explore in terms of um, are we blocked around pleasure? Do we have guilt and shame around it? There's a lot to explore here. In trauma healing, we often do... Um, you know, meditations where you're just kind of touching one hand and breathing really slowly, feeling the sensation, slowing it down so you can feel each moment of touch. And then you come into this present moment through the body and then you're present. So you don't make yourself present, but you use, you know, the body as a vehicle to bring you back into presence. The shopping list, the fantasy, the thoughts are all outside of yourself. And so dissociation means you've abandoned yourself. It's really unsafe to abandon ourselves, especially in intimacy. That's when people let themselves be violated. And there are women who are abused as children who dissociate in sexuality as adults and let all kinds of violent and horrific things happen to their bodies because they've learned how not to be in them. And it's really important that we teach people, especially those who are abused, how to inhabit their bodies because your consciousness is the only guardian of this temple of your body. Nobody else, I mean, people could watch over you, but basically no one else is the guardian of this temple. And if you had frightening and scary things happening when you were young and you learned to leave the body, the most important thing you need to do on your tantric healing journey or trauma healing journey is to come back into the body. And, and also things like walking barefoot and feeling the sensation under your feet, doing yoga, doing embodiment practices, because yoga isn't just a fitness thing. You're actually feeling the body 
moving, feet, you know, you're really learning to get embodied. Any embodiment practice is going to help you heal trauma and heal dissociation. It's really a whole life project. <laughs> you do it on your own, you do it in your relationship, you do it in workshops, but it's a great project. It's really the best project I think a human being can embark on. And we need it globally. We need, we need all of us to start healing from trauma because all of the pain, suffering, war, you know, everything ugly we're seeing is traumatized people, traumatizing other people. And we have to stop it. We have to start healing trauma. It's a, it's a massive urgency across our planet right now. Mm, thank you. Yes, I read something, WHO saying 70% of adults have been through trauma, have had trauma in the world. Something yeah. And I would say 100%. I, I really think it's more like a, a sliding scale mm -hmm. of, you know, rather than a black and white situation. It's mm -hmm. just a matter of how, how intense it's been. Yeah, that's so true. And I love what you say. That's the idea with our film is the to the third stage. We're really seeing this as a golden moment. Can we turn this trauma around into this gift like the hero's journey, the sovereign yes. journey? of transformation yes. we can see that we all have this trauma admitting it moving from denial to yep letting it go and then this is the hero's moment this is the sovereign's yes. moment yes <laughs> i hope so i mean we've just had a global trauma right that nobody even talks about as trauma like people were locked in their homes thinking they were going to die how mm -hmm. traumatic have the last few years been and then it's like okay back to normal and, you know, I, the first things I went to were some ecstatic dance events in the Netherlands. And I was watching people who'd been locked up in their homes for a month, sort of suddenly dancing with other people. And I'd see this trauma response where suddenly someone would start shaking on the dance floor. It would just be like, oh, and then other people would come and put their hands on them. And then they'd cry and then they'd hug people. And then they were back to normal. And I watched it. I watched all these people on the dance floor going through it. And I thought, wow, this this needs to happen across the globe. Otherwise, everybody's going to stay in that traumatic state thinking you're doing life as normal, but you're, you're actually, you know, carrying this new big trauma, um, in your body. So yeah, it's a very important time on many, many levels. Plus, interestingly, we're seeing all this power abuse more and more across the board, aren't we? We're like, you know, it's being it's gurus and teachers and, and politicians and, you know, royals and like pedophiles are like, it's just everywhere. Religions. It's just one after the other of, revelations coming out which can feel very disturbing you start thinking like how to be a human in this world you know how much more can we take so we need to have a way out we need to have some positive thinking here of like okay the world is somewhat traumatized and that has come out in some very messy ways but what are we going to do about it yeah. and i think we really need to have um have that hope and you know have have ways to start healing i think because i live in the world of of healing centers and workshops and retreats i'm i'm quite optimistic in many ways because i'm seeing most mostly what i see on a day-to-day -day basis is people healing and transforming themselves but of course there's many places in society where it's not available and it's not common um but it's time Mm -hmm. I'm glad you're making a documentary because I mean, also me too, of course, but I feel that documentaries are a good first step for the people who aren't yet ready to go to workshops mm -hmm. um, is for people or podcasts for people to start, you know, hearing what's possible. Mm -hmm. and I think it's a first step mm -hmm. and knowing they're not alone as well, knowing it's like, it, this is a systemic thing. I was part of that system and I can heal. There are ways to heal. We need to know that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So how do people find out more about you, Shashi? Where do what's the best place to to connect to you? Gosh, that's the hardest question you've asked yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um I, I mean I I'm very Googleable. Yeah. I'm very Googleable. I have a bunch of web pages. I created a platform called livetantra.com. Um, when I was making my film, I, I was interviewing all these interesting teachers. And then I thought, wow, we need to get this information out, not just in the film. So I think maybe one of the best places is livetantra.com because it's more than me though. But I, I think there are so many interesting voices and, and perspectives. So I think it's, it's, it's good to have more than me. Um, but there are people that I resonate with. Um, and we have symposiums and classes and talks and so much is available on there. So I think that's a good place for people to go and, and kind of look around. Um, my in-person work 
is is more advanced. I, I run teacher trainings. I rarely do anything um, smaller than that because I've been teaching. Actually, you said ten years, and I realized well, it's more like twenty. But I don't want to age myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been teaching for a long time and so I really like to do the deep work and I love to do teacher trainings so that's not for everyone um, so Live Tantra is a good place to go I'm actually teaching in the UK do you know the time that you came is the only time I have ever done anything in the UK really? yeah <laughs> even though I'm yeah even though I'm British I have been uh they call it the the export teacher. I have I have really I mean I lived in a retreat center in Thailand, and I have worked all over Europe. I've worked all over the world, and when I come to England, I'm kind of having family time and <laughs> you know doing a whole other experience. But this year, I've been invited to a festival near Glastonbury. Um, what's it called? The Alchemy of Love Festival. Um, and I'm very excited to kind of like come back to my motherland and teach something because otherwise when I'm in England people will mostly just see me at festivals and I don't even teach workshops I mean I just go and have a lot of fun um, because I, I really value friendship and um, and I also don't always want to be in that role I, like I said I've studied power a lot and I don't always want to be in that position I think it's very important for my well-being and for other people to experience me not in my position of power. So I'm I'm very much out and about um, as a kind of, you know, general punter in festivals, hanging out with friends. And I really value that. Um, so, yeah, so festivals I'm teaching in Ibiza, I, you know, I I don't I'm not so sure I'm so good at publicizing that. Um, <laughs> I'm not the best self-publicist, I think, to be honest. I do have an Instagram wall, but I notice it's full of like um, personal life. One of the things I learned about power is that one of the most harmful things is to get stuck in the role of power, you know, like we see that with the royal family, with all of, with everybody, and lose our humanity. And I've seen Tantra teachers that teach 50 weeks of the year, and they're always in that position. And I notice that power tends to distort much more readily when people are never exposing their humanity and they're always in that position of power. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the gurus in the enlightenment world do that. They're always up high on wearing wide or whatever. So I made a very clear decision to myself a long time ago when I noticed that I'm gonna stay human I'm going to step into that role, be fully responsible while I'm in it. Now I'm your teacher. I'm fully holding you. I'm fully here in this role and I honor it completely. And when it's done, it's complete. And other moments, you're going to meet me and see me in my humanity. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, please do, people who are listening, please go and visit uh, livetantra.com or um, the Shashi Saluna uh, I'll put it in the, the description. Yeah, I had to put a hyphen in. You know, I had shashisaluna.com and it got like, it was down, you know, it, like it needed to be renewed and some Japanese person bought it and put kind of weird Japanese stuff on it. <laughs> so I lost that one. Mm -hmm. It was a bit of a disaster. I was off on a retreat somewhere. So yeah, <laughs> I don't use that one so much anymore. <laughs> so I'll put that into the description and yeah, please do reach out. But it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for your wisdom, uh, the amazing work you're doing, Shashi. And it's so important. It really is. So we'll bless you. Thank you so much. I always, I, I love to do interviews because I always hear different things coming out of me and I know it's a two-way thing. And um, I just so appreciate that you are using your voice to be a voice, especially for our British boarding school system. Um, you know, when I saw that on your podcast, I thought, wow, this is so valuable. And it's really an honor to, to be invited on here. Well, bless you. Mm -hmm. Okay, take care.